السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمت و نستعین و نست فر و نقمن بہی و نتوکل علیہ و نعود بلّہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیعات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدلله فلا حادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه خولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Uh, we are now on to the 39th session of the Seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. As usual, let us have a small recap on the session number 38, which we had last week. Uh, ayahs were revealed about the great sacrifice, sacrifices made by the Sahaba in those two great tra- tragedies that took place. And then right from the beginning, we know that tension, there were a lot of tensions between the Muslims and the Banu Nadir for various reasons, which are also mentioned. Regarding the blood money, Amr ibn Umayyah, who was the only Sahabi who didn't die in that massacre of uh, Bir Mauna, on the way back, he met two people from the same tribe who did the massacre, and he killed them. The Prophet ﷺ agreed to pay the blood money of 200 camels, 100 camels for each person as per the agreement. And the Prophet ﷺ arranged to collect the money from the tribes in Medina as per the agreements between them. There were two attempts to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. One is when Abu Sufyan sent a man to Medina to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. After reaching there and talking to the Prophet ﷺ, he realized that the Prophet ﷺ had a divine protection and later he accepted Islam. The next is Amr ibn Jash of this Banu Nadir. He volunteers to throw a heavy stone on the Prophet ﷺ while he is leaning against the fortress wall. Jibreel Islam informs the Prophet ﷺ and he immediately walks away from the place. Due to this incident, Banu Nadir is expelled. And at this time, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul takes the side of the Banu Nadir and he guarantees the, the, their protection. He says, I will get you people. I will fight along with you. I will also go into exile if such thing happened to you. But later on, he did not help them in any manner. Then we looked at the strategy of uh, Banu Nadir. They around their fortress, they had a lot of uh, dense plantations of date palms so that no RB could enter it. Uh, it would be very difficult for anybody to enter near the fort passing through these dense uh, plantations. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered that only a small, small path that was directly in the way of the Muslim army to be cut and burned down. And those were the ones which were in the path of the army, no other plants were destroyed. So as a defense protocol, the Prophet had arranged to have it done. The Banu Nadir were ordered to leave Madina and they were told to carry as much as they can what a camel would be able to carry for each of them. They moved to Khaybar and there they were welcomed by another Jewish tribe. Then we came to the concept of fai, that is not ghanima, it is not obtained during a war, but without any war taking place, whatever wealth, whatever things are received are called as fai, and the distribution is quite different to that of ghanima. And ultimately, once this Banu Nadir leaves, their land is allotted to the muhajis, the immigrants who came from uh, Makkah. We'll continue, inshallah. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, at the conclusion of the incident of Banu Nadir, 
the entirety of the Surah Al-Hashr was revealed at this time. I had mentioned it at that time in the last class. This is why Abdullah ibn Abbas, he used to refer to Surah Al-Hashr as the gathering. Why? Because it, it talks about the gathering of the people on the day of judgment. And it's also a surah to Bani Nadir, the surah about the Banu Nadir. We come to the next part. During this time, some reports say when the Muslims camped outside the fortress of Banu Nadir, Allah revealed the final ayah regarding alcohol. This was actually brought in three phases. Let's go into each phase to understand the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the first phase, we found in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 219, they ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, concerning alcoholic drink and gambling, say, in them is a great sin and some benefit for men. But the sin of them is greater than their benefit. And they ask you what they sought to spend. Say, that which is beyond your needs. Thus Allah makes clear to you his laws in order that you may give thought. Now, this is an indication we given that avoid alcohol, but there is no explicit prohibition at this particular phase. And this cave, this eye was revealed before uh, the Battle of Badr, before or nearly after the Battle of Badr, but in the Madinian phase. The second phase was right after the Battle of Uhud. An incident occurred where a drunken Sahabi led the prayer and he made some ridiculous mistakes. So Allah revealed in Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 43, O oh, you who believe, approach not as Salah when you are in a drunken state until you know the meaning of what you utter nor when you are in a state of janaba, impurity, except when traveling on the road where water is not, not enough till you wash your whole body. And if you're ill or on a journey, or one of you comes after answering the call of nature, or you have had any sexual relations with women, you find no water, then perform tayyam <clears throat> So the beginning of this ayah clearly mentions about that drinking is prohibited throughout the day. That is from Fajr till post Isha. You understand? So this is how the second phase was brought down. In the third phase, during the siege of Banu Nadir, the final ayah was revealed. This is the final stage, the phase three. You'll find it in Al-Ma'idah, Surah number five, ayah number 19. Oh, you who believe, intoxicants, all kinds of alcoholic drinks, drugs, etc., gambling, al-ansab, and azlam, which is where they used to shoot arrows to try out their luck or to make any decisions, are an abomination of shaitan's handiwork. So avoid that in order that you may be successful. So here it is an order. The alcohol was made haram completely. We go to another issue where we find why were some of the ignorant women of Yathrib, before it was called Madina, ready to make their sons as Jews? There was a custom in the Jahiliya, the days of ignorance, that a woman who had many miscarriages used to pray and make a commitment saying, Oh Allah, if you bless me with a son, I'll make him into a Jew. But why? Because the Arabs of Yathrib felt that the Jews were superior to them in civilization, education, wealth, religion, etc. So that is why they took this oath. There was a group of such people adopted by Banu Nadir. And these young men had grown up and for all practical purposes, they were considered as Jews. When the expulsion took place, some of the Yathribites, the people of Yathrib, 
who were actually Ansars and whose people, whose sons had been given to the Jews, they suddenly said, we will not allow our sons to be expelled. They wanted their sons to renounce Judaism and come back to Islam. You understand the situation why it came like that? They did not want their sons to be expelled along with the Banu Nadir. And it is also known that once these people accept Islam, the Prophet will excuse them. They will not be considered for expulsion. And once they convert, they can continue to remain in Medina. And their possessions also can remain with them. So the parents wanted to force their adult children who had become fully Jewish, they had believed in Judaism, they had forced them to come and accept Islam. Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 256 reads, La ikrah deen. There is no compulsion in religion. Verily, the right path has become distinct from the wrong path. Whoever disbelieves in the Tawud, their desires, etc., and believes in Allah, then he is grasped by the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. And Allah is the all-hearer, all-knower. So this was the reason for the revelation of this ayah. Many of the tafasir, we may not find it, but it is specifically mentioned in Ibn Kathir. Allah says, truth and falsehood is very clear. So it's up to them to decide. It's their decision because they are now adults. And once the child is an adult, the child is completely independent. They can choose whatever they want. Also, I want to refer to the last ayah of Surah Al-Kafirun. Lakum deenukum deen. Many of us use this wrongly. Here, deen does not necessarily mean religion. It is a way of life. And in Surah Al-Kafirun, the Mushriks came to the Prophet and they wanted to negotiate an understanding that they should pray, they will pray according to the Muslims on one day and on the next day, the Muslims should pray according to the Kafirun. It is in this context that it was said, we will not do it. You do what you want to do and we will do what we want to do. So it is wrong for us to refer this and tell everybody, leave them, they'll let them follow whatever they want. We have to be careful in this. Now, actually, what is it that gave birth to secularism? It's become so popular now, we ourselves are finding it very difficult. Actually, Islam has freedom of religion. But it's not the way we understand. Yes, we, we can find a uh, compatible happy means to live, but ideal Islam is not what we or the Western civilizations think. There are a lot of differences. In the endless uh, wars, civil wars that took place in, of Christianity long ago, you will find that the Catholics had dominated every sphere of life, including religion, politics, science, everything. Anything done or anything discovered had to have the approval of the Catholic priests. If they say no, it should not be done. And if it is done, they are executed. So the Catholics were the reason why they persecuted the Protestants and they also killed their own brethren. There was a, for, a, for a war between the Catholics, the Protestants, and the other sects of Christianity. And it lasted for thousands of years. And those who were prosecuted by these Catholics, who were oppressed a lot, used to leave the place. And it was only after many learned men including scientists, etc., who left England, migrated to other places, they were able to think and act independent of, to the Christians. It is this that led them to fear religion. They did not want to have, a, they did not want religion to have anything to do with their ways of life. 
Therefore, this is what gave birth to secularism. They needed it in order to survive. Or else what happened? They were trying at each other's throat. Islam didn't or does not have such an issue. Our civilization is very different. We don't need the type of secularism that, we, uh, that exists now. We Muslims believe that our faith is true. But if anyone wants to follow a faith or belief, something else, that's their business. We are not going to say it's okay morally and it's your own business, etc. We just leave it to them for them to decide. Historically, we see this from the very beginning. The ayah, which I mentioned above, is very explicit proof. And it came down for the Muslim Ansars. They were not allowed to force their own sons back to Islam. This is a very profound interpretation of freedom that did not exist earlier. We'll go to the next part of it. The reaction of Banu Khuraida. Now, knowing that uh, Banu Nadir were expelled from there, one of the leaders of Banu Khuraida, Amir ibn Saad al khuradi he was very devout worship, worshiper. He was a very uh, uh, religious Jew and was known to spend most of his time inside the synagogue. So he went to the area where Banu Nadir were expelled and found it completely abandoned. He told his tribe, that this expulsion of Banu Nadir was because of their deception against the Muslims and because of their combativeness and defiance against the Muslims. So in order to avoid a similar fate for his tribe, he appealed to his people that they follow the Prophet ﷺ to avoid being expelled from their own lands. And then Amr, Amr also referred them to two elderly, knowledgeable scholars of the Jewish tribes who had passed away before the coming of the Prophet ﷺ, he said they had clearly mentioned of the coming of the Prophet ﷺ and the signs also, and that the Prophet ﷺ was to be followed once he arrives. So one Zubair from Banu Khuraida, he confirmed this. So Kab ibn Asad, a leader of Banu Khuraida, he responded, why don't you believe in him? If you're telling us to do all this, why don't you say? If you say that you've read about the Prophet ﷺ, then why don't you believe in him? Zubay's reply was, I don't believe in him because of you. You are our leader. If you follow him and believe in him, then we will follow him. We, we will also follow suit. But if you refuse, since you're the leader, we will also refuse. So this Amr ibn Asad, he asked Kaab, why do you not believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Everybody is now referring to you. They're saying they will do what you will do. This guy responded, I don't have a reason to give you as to why I don't believe. The reason is that I'm a leader. I can't be a follower. My nafs won't accept me deferring to someone else or giving my authority to someone else. I can't do it. This is how Banu Khuraida ultimately decided not to accept Islam and that they were going to fight it out. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, here is a map which we have here on the expeditions that took place after Uhud. We will be dealing with these one after the other. Uh, we will start with the battle of uh, second battle of uh, Badr. I'm sorry. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, why did the Prophet ﷺ go to Badr? What was the necessity for him to go to Badr? And that too, expecting a second battle of Badr. So, when the month of Shaban arrived, the Prophet ﷺ he gathered about thousand five hundred Sahaba and set out in the direction of Badr. Why? To meet Abu Sufyan and the Quraysh. Why? They had challenged the Muslims that they would come and attack a second time in Badr. The Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba actually did not want to have any bloodshed. At the same time, 
they wanted to also establish that element of dignity and honor. He said, you have challenged us, you have called us, we will respond to this challenge and we will stand our ground. No, it's for you to come or not. The implications of not going could have been really very severe. It could be understood or determined as weakness of the Muslims and that the Muslims were afraid of the Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ left Abdullah ibn Ubay's son, Abdullah, in charge of Medina. Can you imagine the son of the hypocrite is put in charge of Medina? Because this man was a true Muslim. His Islam was one of excellence. That is why the Prophet ﷺ chose him to take charge of Medina. This clearly shows that the Prophet ﷺ did not hold the crimes or the sins of the father against the son. Just think about how difficult that would have been for any of us. Imagine how our own hatred, our jealousy, our anger and our malice gets the best of us. If someone does something or says something which is inappropriate with us, then not only his entire extended family, but the entire other relatives, everyone become an enemy all of a sudden. We declare war against anyone who lives in that person's neighborhood also. Look to the extent that we go. And look at how the Prophet ﷺ addressed this issue. The Prophet ﷺ was sent to teach us and to purify our hearts and also our inner conditions. We have to take our lessons from there. Now Abu Sufyan remembered that he had issued the challenge and heard that the Prophet ﷺ had already departed from Medina. So he gathered a force to get a force and they all set out from Makkah. They proceeded to a, a place which was called Usfan, which was uh, fairly close for, to Makkah, but quite far from Badr. Then Abu Sufyan announced to his forces, O oh, people of Quraysh, this year has been very difficult. We've been dealing with a drought and economic hardship. Actually, at those times, there was a severe drought in Makkah. So Abu Sufyan says, I'm going back to Makkah. You all should also go back to Makkah. I'm going to go back because things are bad at home. And I advise you to do the same. So what did they do? They camped at Usfan for a few days. Whatever supplies of food that they had got along with them, they were stayed there till the supplies of food were completed. Can you imagine? The people of Makkah started to taunt them, saying what? Jaishur Savik. You peep, this is an army of Savik. Uh, you remember some sessions back I had told you how the Savik was prepared from barley, a powder is made uh, after crushing barley, etc., and the grains packed into bags. And by adding water, this becomes a food, a very nourishing food. So they completed, they finished all these supplies and then returned to Makkah. What a great idea. Now, this is actually a moral victory. It was standard of the time of that to give your enemy about eight days from the day of your arrival to show up or to communicate. If the enemy did not come within this period, you could depart from that place and you would not be marked as a retreating army. Or no, no fighting occurred at all in the second Badr campaign. So you can't say that the Muslim army ran back, that they retreated. With the permission of the Prophet ﷺ, what did the Sahaba do? They started trading, they started buying, trading and selling their goods. And they also set up a market for the nearby Bedouin tribes to come and trade. By the time they returned to Medina, they had made twice as much of what they had brought with them. Allah granted them barakah and blessing in this business of theirs. After completion of the eight-day period, the Muslims returned to Medina 
and thereby the Muslims were de declared as victorious. The news spread all through Arabia. So as the Sahaba were heading back to Madinah, Allah revealed an ayah, Surah Ali Imran, Surah number three, ayah number 174. So they returned with grace and bounty from Allah. No harm touched them and they followed the good pleasure of Allah and Allah is the owner of all bounty. Because the Sahaba did what the Prophet ﷺ had said and Allah had commanded them to do, not only they did not mean, meet any harm, but they were able to get back a lot of material blessings and gifts that Allah had provided. And they got double the profits. Now we come to the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ passes away. This was in the month of uh, Jumada al-Ula, the fourth year of Hijrah. The grandson of the Prophet ﷺ named Abdullah passed away at the age of six due to illness. Who is Abdullah? Abdullah was the son of Uthman, Uthman ibn Affan anhu, and Rukhiya bint Muhammad anha. So, this happened at the conclusion of the Battle of Badr. The Prophet ﷺ participated in the washing and shrouding of the body. He also offered the janaza of his grandson. And Prophet ﷺ and Uthman who lowered the body of the child into the grave. We next come to the marriage of the Prophet ﷺ with Umm Salama. In a session 37, you will recall, we had mentioned of Abu Salama participating in the Sadiya of Banu Asad. And that is on his return, his wound opened up again as a result of which he fell ill and he died in the month of Jumad al Ula. Now, Umm Salama herself narrated, one day my husband Abu Salama came home after spending some time with the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I heard something from the Prophet ﷺ today and it made me so happy. It was so profound. I was fascinated by what I heard. He said, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned, whenever any Muslim suffers some type of a loss or is dealing with a tragedy, and they should make, then they should make the following dua. Inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi raji'oon. Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa akhlif li khairam minha. Verily, we belong to Allah and true, truly to him we shall return. O Allah, reward me in my difficulty and adversity and give me something better than what I have lost. So she said, when Abu Salama passed away, I made this dua that I learned from him. But for the moment, I thought to myself, I had full conviction in the dua, but where will I ever find a husband better than Abu Salama? Where can I get such a husband? She continued, when my idda, that's the mourning period, was over, the Prophet ﷺ asked permission to visit me. I got properly dressed, invited the Prophet ﷺ. I put a comfortable pillow and requested him to sit on the pillow. And there it was that the Prophet ﷺ proposed, made a marriage proposal to me. She replied, O Messenger of Allah, I would be honored to be your wife, but there's an issue. I'm a very private type of a person. I'm very closed off. I have difficulty in warming up to people and letting people into my life. I know it will take me some time to really conduct myself as a wife should conduct with a husband. And I'm afraid of offending you in the meantime while I get over my own issues. And if I do that, Allah will get upset with me because you are the messenger of Allah. I cannot offend, uh, offend you. I'd rather not be married to you than marry you and offend you. The next issue is, I'm also an older woman. You should know that. And also, I have children to look after. I have a lot of responsibility for my kids. 
who have already lost their father. What did the Prophet say? He said, Allah will make that easier for you. I am not worried about that. This was the way of the Prophet was saying, don't worry. I will be very accommodating and understanding. This shows the gentleness and chivalry of the Prophet He continued, number two, as far as you're talking about being an old woman, I would like to have an older, mature woman that I can converse with and who can understand what I'm talking about. As for the third point, you talk about your children. Your children will be my children. Why are you so worried? I'm here. I will be your husband and I will be a father to them and take complete responsibility. Umm Salma narrated, I then agreed to marry the Prophet In fact, Allah did give me someone better than Abu Salama. And that someone was the Prophet Her dua was answered by Allah in this way. <coughs> Sorry. Now, how did Umm Salma stand out as related to the other wives? She quickly became the spokesperson for Medina. Shortly after her marriage, a deputation of women asked her why they were mentioned so rarely in the Quran. Why is it the Quran is not telling much about women? She brought this question to the Prophet. A few days later, she heard the Prophet reciting a revolutionary new. Ayah in the mosque. It was from Surah Al Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayah number 35. The interpretation reads Verily, the Muslim men and women, the believers men and women, the men and women who are obedient to Allah, the men and women who are truthful, the men and women who are patient, the men and women who are humble the men and women who give sadaqa, the men and women who observe fasting, the men and women who guard their chastity, and the men and women who remember Allah much with their hearts and tongues, Allah has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. That is Jannah. Subhanallah. How beautifully her doubt has been clarified. Okay. Now we go to the birth of Hassan ibn Ali Razalatala Anhu. Yes, another incident that happened at around this time was the birth of the first grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib Razalatala Anhu. When he was born, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Ali, "Show me my son." That's actually grandson, and then he asked. What did you name him? Ali Razalatala and who said Harb. The meaning of Harb is war. It's a very common pre-Islamic name. The Prophet said, No, he is not Harb, rather, he is beauty, Hassan. So he was named as Hassan. In Abu Dawood, it's narrated that the Prophet gave Adan in Hassan's right ear. And then the Prophet ﷺ instructed Fatima Razilatala Anha and Ali Razilatala Anhu shave off his hair and give the weight of his hair in silver in charity. It means just give some small amount in charity. He performed the Akika of for Hassan and he was the one who sacrificed two sheep and made the invitation. The Prophet ﷺ married Zainab binte Huzaima. Zainab binte Huzaima was a Makkan woman who was previously married to Abdullah ibn Jash. The Prophet Sallallahu cousin who was martyred and mutilated in the Battle of Ahad was this Abdullah ibn Jash. Now, please remember, this Zainab is not the same, the, the, not the Zainab of Zaid ibn Thabit. Now, this Zainab, his wife Zainab's title was Ummul Masakin, 
the mother of the poor. She used to take care of the poor in Madina. She would feed them and take care of anyone who was not able to take care of themselves. The Prophet ﷺ gave a mahar of 12 and a half grams of gold to Zainab. She used all this to help the people around, to help the orphans in Madina. She passed away two months after marrying the Prophet ﷺ. We now go to Zaid ibn Thabit, a Hufar, knowledge of Mirath, that is inheritance, and he also had a knowledge of the language of the Hebrew, Hebrew language. He was the adopted son of the Prophet ﷺ. As I said, he was a Hufaz of the Quran, and the Prophet ﷺ recommended him as a teacher of the Quran. And Zaid had also learned about Mirath, that is inheritance law from the Prophet ﷺ, who said, if you have any question about inheritance, go to Zaid ibn Thabit. He will clarify to you. The Sahaba themselves had so much confidence in Zaid that after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Abu Bakr who appointed Zaid who as the project manager of the group who would put together the compilation of the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ was having some trouble dealing with the Jewish tribes in and around Madina, like Banu Nadir, and he was doubtful and skeptical of some of the Jewish translators because he did not know the language. He felt that they were in, these translators were instigating that they were not and they were not translating properly. So the Prophet ﷺ told Zaid, I want you to learn their language. I want you to learn Hebrew and study their religious texts. And I want you to be my translator. In a narration of uh, the Sahih, Zaid said, I learned the language in 15 days and I became the official translator of the Prophet ﷺ. Such talented people remind you of the statement of Abdullah ibn Masood when he said, Allah chose these people for the companionship of the Prophet ﷺ. We now go to Ghazwa Daturika. That is the campaign of bandages. I know it sounds uh, puzzling. Datu means the one who possesses, the one who has something. Rikha means patches, like you have patches of cloth. Now, let us see how the uh, people of the Sira who studied the Sira have interpreted this. Ibn Hisham stated that when the armies would march, they would have certain banners as a means of organizing the army together. So some of the banners or the flags of the Sahaba were stitched together with small strips of uh, uh, clothing, not of the same color, different, different colors. They were all patched together and made into a flag. Other historians mentioned that there was a huge tree at the spot where they had matched, marched to, and that was called as Daturika. Al-Wakhidi stated there was a particular mountain there that would reflect different shades of colors. And that is why it was sometimes called Daturika. The, let's go to the actual incident that took place. The Prophet ﷺ had a group of scouts who were keeping an eye on the area around Madina so that he would know about anyone who was approaching the city. Then the scouts came and reported to the Prophet ﷺ, there were some Bedouin tribes to the north in the area of Najd who had started amassing an army and were unifying the Bedouin tribes to wage a war against the Prophet ﷺ in the city of Madina. So the Prophet ﷺ gathered a group of Sahaba and they started marching towards Najd. As you will see in the map, the journey was very long and it was the hottest part of the year. The Muslims had very meager and humble supplies. They didn't have enough animals for everyone to ride upon. And as they were traveling, their shoes began to wear out and their feet started to blister and bleed. So what did they do? They ripped out strips from their clothes their shawls and blankets, and they used it 
to bandage their feet. Now try to visualize all these Sahaba who were marching for a war and their feet were bandaged up. That is one of the reasons why this was called as Ghadwa Datulika, the campaign of bandages. They finally arrived to a place of Ghadfan. You'll see that in the map, where they met the other army. The Muslims and the other army were camped across each other, but there was no fighting that took place. There was no battle at all. Both sides decided that it was best if there wasn't any actual military engagement. At the same time, this was a very strategic move by the Prophet ﷺ because it sent a message to the people of Ghadfan that the Muslims of Medina were not negligent or they were not unaware of what's going on, or, uh, going on around them and that they will take all measures to protect and defend themselves, their homes, their families, and their lives. It was during this expedition, it is said that the prayer of fear was ordained. Even though no actual fighting took place, the expedition was very dangerous. Surah Nisa gives a much needed reprieve in the form of prayer of fear. If you go to Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah 101, and when you Muslims travel in the land, there is no sin on you if you shorten the salah, if you fear that the disbelievers may attack you. Verily, the disbelievers are never, are ever unto you open enemies. The method of prayer was given in the very next ayah. Ayah number 102. When you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are among them and lead them in a salah, let one party of them stand up in salah with you, taking their arms with them. When they finish their prostrations, let them take their positions in the rear and let the other party come up, which has not prayed, and let them pray with you, taking all precautions and bearing arms. Those who, disbel uh, who, those who disbelieve wish, if you were negligent of your arms and your baggage, to attack you in a single rush. But there is no sin on you if you put away your arms because of the inconvenience of rain or because you are ill. But take every precaution for yourselves. Verily, Allah has prepared a humiliating torment for the disbelievers. See how beautiful, uh, beautifully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed to offer the prayer of fear. Now, there's a man, Gaurat ibn al-Hadith, who attempts to attack the Prophet One of the very notable incidents that took place concerned the, in the, concerned the individual, Gaurat ibn al-Hadith, who belonged to another tribe, Banu Muharrib, and which was a part of a larger clan of Ghatfan. He went to some of his people and asked, what are we doing here having this long drawn face off against Prophet and uh, against Muhammad and his followers? Would you like for me to just go there and take care of the situation? His people replied, of course. How are you going to go about killing him? Yes, he's got an army with him and he is surrounded by his companions. Gaurat said, I will pay some, play some type of a trick with him. He went to the Muslim camp. He, he did not at all look aggressive. He was unarmed. He appeared to be very unassuming. He was therefore allowed to come in. The Prophet was sitting there with his sword in his lap. Now this Gaurat sat down by the Prophet and said, Ya Muhammad, وسلم, do you mind if I look at your sword? I would like to admire your sword. The Prophet ﷺ said, sure, go ahead. So he unsheathed the sword and started to wave the sword at the Prophet. He pointed the sword to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Muhammad, aren't you afraid of me? The Prophet ﷺ replied, no, Allah will protect me from you. Allah will prevail, prevent you from harming me. One narration states that Ghadwat 
then returned the sword to the Prophet ﷺ. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah. You will find it in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah number 5, ayah number 11. O you who believe, remember the favor of Allah unto you when some people desire to stretch out their hands against you. But Allah withheld their hands from you. So fear Allah and in Allah let believers put their trust. Another narration states that the sword fell out from his hands and the Prophet ﷺ took the sword and asked Gaurat, do you believe in Allah? He said, no, I don't believe, but I will promise you one thing. I will never fight against you, nor will I ever be with those people who wage war against you. The Prophet ﷺ said, all right, fine, go to your way. He went back to his people and he told them, I return back to you having met the most remarkable human being I have ever met. He told them about the prayer, the conduct of the Prophet ﷺ and the character of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba. We now come to a very important incident that took place. The Salah of Abad ibn Bishr. A huge lesson for us in that. Another remarkable incident that took place concerned the spirituality of the Sahaba and their dedication in their ibadah as trained by the Prophet. One of the mushrikun who was very upset due to this uh, run in with the Muslims, he started to scream an oath near the Muslim camp. He said, I have been humiliated. I have been insulted. I will not stop until I shed the blood of some of the people of the Prophet ﷺ. He started to circle around. He started to stalk and stick out at the Muslim camp. And he would look for some type of opportunity for one Sahaba to stray away from the camp for some need or the other so that this mushrik could pounce on him. The Prophet ﷺ asked his Sahaba if anyone would like to volunteer because he said, we need some guards and scouts to stay on the perimeter of the camp and have a lookout and make sure that this guy doesn't come in the middle of the night and kill someone. So Amr ibn Yasir from the Muhajirs and Abad ibn Bishar from the Ansar, both of them volunteered. The Prophet ﷺ said, I want you to go outside of the camp and position yourselves at the mouth of the valley. I want you to set out there on the perch that's on top so you can see anyone even in the middle of the night who's trying to approach the camp. They did so as the Prophet ﷺ instructed them and they went out towards the valley. Here Abbad said to Amar, which shift would you like to have? Would you like me to go first or last? Amr ibn Yasir, he was very much in the habit of waking up before Fajr and praying the Qiyam. He said, I prefer that you go first. I can handle a couple of hours before Salat al-Fajr. But this is the time I usually turn in. If you can handle the early part of the night, then I can take care of the last part of the night. So Abad the Ansari took the first watch. He stood at the, on the perch to keep a lookout. Uh, it seemed quite uh, uneventful for him. Nothing was happening. So what he said, he thought to himself, while I'm just standing here, I may as well utilize my time effectively. I will do my salah. He then started to pray. He started to, to recite the Quran in his salah. This mushrik saw a bird standing on the perch in the middle of the night. He realized that this is the man that the Prophet ﷺ had sent to keep watch on and to notify everyone if anyone tries to approach the Muslim camp. Before he got too close, the mushrik, what he did was, he drew and shot an arrow towards Abad. And the arrow hit Abad. The Ansari Abad. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who he was standing in prayer, 
he was struck by the arrow. He ripped the arrow out of his body and threw it on the ground and continued his salah. The mushrik shot another arrow, which hit Abag again as he was praying. Once again, he ripped this arrow out, threw it on the ground and continued to pray. Same thing happened on the third arrow. Now, he went to the ruku and then he went for his sajda and he finished his salah quickly. Then Abad woke up Amr ibn Yasir and he said, hurry up and get up, I have been hit. The moment Amr stood up, the mushrik saw that in addition to this man, there was some, some other person also. So already there were two people. He thought, okay, there are two of them. There must be more as well. There could be more of them. He got scared and he ran away from there. When Amr ibn Yasser saw Abad ibn Bashir, bleeding like this, he said, Subhanallah, what's going on? Why didn't you wake me up the first time you were hit? The reply was, I was reciting a lengthy surah. I did not want to cut it short. I wanted to finish my surah. But when he kept on hitting me with arrows, I concluded my salah and decided to wear, wake you up. I swear to Allah, if it was not for the possibility of not fulfilling the responsibility that the Prophet had entrusted with me to guard the place, and if I wasn't keeping watch, I would have lost my life before I cut my surah short. SubhanAllah. Either I would have died or I would have finished my surah. Cutting the surah short was not my option, but I realized that I had a very great responsibility given to me by the Prophet ﷺ. This narration is discussed for another reason within the realm of fiqh about the issue of whether or not bleeding breaks your wudu. That's another whole issue. We will not take it up in this particular session. Now understand, the Sahaba lived by a very, very high code. They lived in a completely different code. The Sahaba had one principle, Allah. They lived for Allah. They breathed for Allah. They fought for Allah. They gave up for Allah. They slept, ate, worked for Allah. They were willing to die for Allah. These are the same individuals about whom Allah said, in Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayah number 23, among the believers are men true to what they promised Allah. Among them is he who has fulfilled his vow to the death. And among them is he who avails his, awaits his chance and they did not alter the commitment by any alteration. They stood to themselves. Also, in Surah An-Nur, Surah number 24, Ayah 37, men whom neither trade nor sale diverts them from the remembrance of Allah, nor from performing a salah, nor from giving the zakah, they fear a day when hearts and eyes will be overturned. That is, the Akhirah. Subhanallah, this is the way the Sahaba used to live. This, this was their life. And we have a lot of lessons to take from them. And again, I'm repeating, all these are mentioned in the Quran so beautifully, so wonderfully. Let us not, let us take this Quran seriously. Let us try to understand the Quran. Let us make a niyyah to Allah. Yeah, Allah, I'm reading this Quran. I want to understand it. You clarify things to me. You put that Quran into my heart so that I'm able to live by the Quran as much. I can make my efforts to live by the Quran and follow and obey the Prophet. Ameen. Ya Rabbil Alameen. We'll stop for now. Inshallah, let's go to the duas. Allahumma anfa'ani bima allamtani wa allimni ma yanfa'ani wa zidni ilma. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-khabr 
ومن فتنة المحيا وممات ومن شر فتنة المسيح الدجال ربنا أتمم لنا نورنا وغفر لنا إنك على كل شيء قدير ربنا اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته